Well, we're on to section 12.5. It's hard to believe that this chapter is already over. But this is on conserving America's forests. You know, if you're anything like me, uh, you grew up watching cartoons, right? Um, I love cartoons. I love Spongebob. Um, it's one of my favorites. Um, I also liked um, Penguins of Madagascar. Anyone ever watch that? Um, they had a TV show running for a while. They also had, of course, um, the uh, movie, too. Well, anyway, let's take a trip to Madagascar, shall we? I think it's uh, kind of a cool place. I've never been there, of course. It's the world's fourth largest island, and 90% of the species there are unique. What does that mean? 90% of the species found in Madagascar are found nowhere else in the world. They're only found in Madagascar. That's pretty incredible. It means if you take a trip to Madagascar, 90% of the things you see, you, you have never seen before in your life. 90% of the animals, 90% of the trees, 90% of um, the algae, uh, everything. And that, that's pretty crazy. I mean, it'd be like walking into a whole different world. Uh, the problem is, is that Madagascar is a developing nation, and of course a developing nation needs a lot of tools. And so what, what these people from Madagascar are doing is they're cutting down their trees, they're burning the land to allow for development of apartments and um, all kinds of things. They're burning a lot of fossil fuels in order to get caught up with the rest of the world. They want to be like us, and you know how we got to where we're at? in our post-industrial age is um, we burn a lot of fossil fuels. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, take a look at this uh, <laughs> take a look at this um, these two pictures. Uh, I bet you've never seen a tree like that before um, or, or like that one. And uh, bushes like that, completely unique. Um, and uh, and yet these trees are being cut down even though there's not many of them left in the world, or not many of them at all in the world. In fact, some of these species of tree, there's only about 13 of them. Um, I was reading about one, there was 13 of these trees left, and, and they were trying to cut them down to make wood for houses. Um, or these uh, lemurs that are found just nowhere else in the world. So what do we do? Do we protect it all? Do we tell those in Madagascar that they can't cut down their land? Do they? Do we tell them to just go ahead and cut down everything? Well, let's think of a thoughtful, balanced, biblical perspective. We don't want to be too far on one side, saying you can't use your land that God gave you. We also don't want to be on the other side, um, abuse the land God gave you. So we should be in the middle. Um, a thoughtful, balanced, biblical perspective. God did give us the earth to subdue, to conquer, to use, uh, to learn from to build on, um, but we do have to be wise stewards. If I was living on a plot of land that had some endangered species of um, of lemur, let's say, because we're in Madagascar, you know, we really have to be thoughtful and say, well, should I build out back, or, or maybe, I should, maybe I should look into getting a different plot of land. Um, that's not to say that necessarily um, building land, building on land is wrong. But just have a thoughtful, balanced, biblical perspective with what you do. Don't excessively do anything. And that's a, that's a good principle in just regular life anyway. You know, just don't excessively spend money on, you know, any one thing or don't excessively save like crazy and, and never do anything fun. Uh, balance there is worthwhile. Well, anyway, um, I think our former president, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, had, had some pretty good ideas on conserving America's forest. And you can see Theodore Roosevelt uh, there. Uh, he is He's a pretty incredible guy. Apparently, um, during one of his speeches, he got shot. And um, he 
kept on speaking. He said it's going to take more than one bullet to take down this moose. <laughs> so um, he was a he was a pretty hardened fellow. But anyway, he ordered a committee to study the conditions of America's forest. Um, he said, I want to know what's going on here. And he made a couple of good laws. He decreed that loggers must clean up the slash or logging debris. You can't just leave stuff everywhere. Because people are just leaving sawdust. Well, what's sawdust? Um, sawdust is very, very flammable. So this stuff will caught up and catch on fire, and then there'd be all kinds of problems. They'd be leaving equipment everywhere, uh, dead fallen trees that they didn't want. The, he decreed a law that said, you got to clean that stuff up and make America look nice. He created the U.S. Forest Service to manage our resources, to try and make sure that the U.S. has a pretty balanced um, um, private ownership of, of land as well as public ownership of land. And these forests help uh, parts of America to remain as um, original as possible. Because remember... Uh, 300 years ago, um, aside from uh, the various um, Native American settlements and Coeur de Bois of the French that were in Canada, America was pretty uh, pretty untouched. It was pretty much all forest. So, anyway, um, Theodore Roosevelt did that, creating a better forest. A um, couple things here. Sustainable forestry is a practice of using science to keep forests growing for harvesting lumber. They actually have data scientists who do this that tell exactly how um, much to um, cut down and when to replant and and all those sorts of things. It's a very interesting science. And they encourage reforestation, replanting trees that are cut down. You see, just a small seed becomes that huge tree. And trees have the um, very unique ability to do photosynthesis and pretty much grow on their own with, of course, um, carbon dioxide, which we have plenty of, and, and water as well, which the water cycle keeps um, allowing water to go in the ground. We also have what's called genetically modified organisms, GMOs. Oh boy. You ready? So I'm looking on the uh, back of my smuckers seedless raspberries right and watch out this is a genetically modified raspberry what does that even mean um well, i've i have raspberry on me now um what that means is is that this isn't raspberries that are found in the wild these are ones that we actually have grown in fact, this is crazy, right? Um, there are patents, so U.S. patents, stuff that you that you purchase to protect your product. There are patents on seeds. Isn't that crazy? That people have designer seeds that they can put in the ground, and these designer seeds are unlike any other seeds, and they grow different, and they use less water, and they they do all sorts of things. But a lot of people believe that. Um, a lot of people believe that these genetically modified organisms, genetically modified plants, are very bad things. So here I pulled off one of their websites, you know, corn plus extra DNA equals uh, some crazy wild corn. And in fact, there are some pretty wild things. For instance, um, corn grown in the U.S., genetically modified corn, has the DNA. They put DNA of bacteria and viruses in that corn. Why do they do that? You mean I'm eating bacteria and viruses? Well, yeah, you are. Well, that's not good. I thought bacteria and viruses were bad, and, and some of them are. Um, all viruses that we know of are bad. Uh, but actually, we found that when we put the bacterial and virus DNA into the corn, that it actually prevents the corn from getting diseased. Oh, isn't that strange? And there's some things that we can, some DNA that we can put in corn and other products to make them resistant to insects. Insects smell them, they're like, I don't want this, that's not real corn. And they fly somewhere else and we, we eat it. Um, and so there's a little bit of an argument going on as far as genetically modified organisms go. Are they helpful? Um, 
Is it organic? Um, is organic any better? It's certainly more expensive, right? Well, let me be the first to say that genetically modified organisms, without them, we would be unable to feed everyone in the world. You see, until genetically modified organisms um, and plants were created, there was a, there was a huge shortage of, of food. And um, it wasn't until we actually started mass producing these genetically modified organisms on a large scale that we were actually able to feed all of America. And with the seven plus billion people in the world, we do need some genetically modified organisms. We don't have enough farmland to be 100% organic. But is organic healthier? Well, I'll let you do that research for yourself. I think there are pros and cons to eating um, organic food. One of the big cons, of course, is the price. Um, I love my organic kashi cereal in the morning and I and I eat that because it's the only cereal I can find that that doesn't have a huge amount of salt and I'm watching my salt intake and uh, it's four dollars for the cereal it's not even a big box but um, of course what I, I know what I'm eating I'm eating 100% wheat I'm not eating anything else that's crazy maybe some bacteria DNA or something so, not, but I'm not really afraid of genetically modified organisms. I, I really am not. I'm not against them. Um, protecting our forests, this is um, the last idea. What do, what do the forests need protection from? Fire. Smokey the Bear campaign was very effective. Um, still, They still run commercials. Only you can prevent wildfires. Right? You're Smokey the Bear. Disease. A blight is a fungus that attacks trees. So we're going to talk about the Irish potato famine and how this famine decimated uh, plants in Ireland, uh, potato plants. And unfortunately, these plants spread it to one another. Uh, the blight grows on one plant, and it spreads to another plant, spreads to another plant. So sometimes we need to kill a plant and destroy it in order to save the rest of the crop. Uh, insects. Uh, hungry bark beetles eat through trees. Um, some animals... Uh, girdle or eat a band of bark around a tree causing it to die um, and so we do we do need to watch out for particular insects and animals and that's why we have um, what we call insecticide it kills insects now some people think insecticide is a very bad thing and that spraying our trees with spraying our uh, crops with insecticide actually causes some uh, poisoning in fact there is a um, I think it's an eight billion dollar lawsuit against um, miracle Grow. Oh, no, not miracle Grow. Um, what's that weed killer, hun? Give me just a second, I'll find it. Found it, all right? It's actually Roundup, so it's a weed killer. And farmers spray these all over their fields to prevent weeds from growing up. Right, and so they'll spray them right here to to make sure that uh, no weeds grow up and choke out the plant or anything. And it it turns out that Roundup's causing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's um, a form of cancer, a very dangerous form of cancer, and it's affecting people all over the world. In fact, we use it here at CCS. We pour it all over the uh, sidewalks and stuff so weeds don't grow on our sidewalk. And so some things we may be spraying on our plants may not be the best things for us. In fact, um, you may be eligible for compensation. And uh, there's a massive lawsuit against that kind of stuff. Well, anyway, hope we learned a little bit more about plants, maybe a little bit more about Roundup and about conserving our forest. I hope that you develop a biblical, balanced position in how you view the forest around you. Um, make sure that you complete section of view 12.5 page 468 numbers 1 through 5. That is the of course um, end of the chapter 12 notes. Your test will be coming soon so make sure you are loosely preparing for that. Of course it will be open book still. So anyways have a good morning, afternoon, evening whenever you're watching this and I will see you guys later.